fates of fighter ace Adolf Galland and Germany were bound together during the start of World War II. Both enjoyed great successes in the initial campaigns. Germany quickly stormed across Western Europe, consuming nation after nation, and Galland became a living legend of the air and a hero for Germany, as he added victories to his resume. During the Battle of Britain, Gallen took the lead amongst aces and was promoted to the position of wing commander, along with his fellow ace, Werner Mulders. But here, Germany's torrid progress to expand its military empire stalled. The fierce resistance they faced from the RAF, combined with the ineptitude of the Luftwaffe's high command, poisoned Germany's conquest of Britain. Hitler turned his attention to the Eastern Front, and although Operation Barbarossa was initially successful, Galland and the Luftwaffe faced tragedy, the suicide of Ernst Udet and the accidental death of Werner Mulders. At this time, Adolf Galland found himself in an unhappy position, as he was forced to take mantle of General of the Fighters from fallen ace and friend Mulders. However, in this new role, Galland would soon find himself in Hitler's inner circle planning a top-secret mission, Operation Thunderbolt, the Channel Dash. Hitler had leaded this meeting by himself and he said he wanted to have the capital shifts in Norway because he was of, of the opinion that the English would recapture Norway and he wanted to avoid this in any case. For Hitler, holding on to Norway was a key to the success of Operation Barbarossa. If the Allies established a foothold there, then Germany would have yet another front with which to contend. At the time, the region was largely undefended, as troops and aircraft were mired in battle with the Soviets. Sailing his navy, stationed at Brest, to Norway, was a stopgap measure to prevent an Allied invasion. Hitler, he said, uh, he knew that this operation would be extremely dangerous, but uh, all his actions in the last years before the war and during the war, the war had been very dangerous, so he was decided to make this operation. The question was only, should the ships go around England or should they go through the channel? Both ways were really risky because the way around England would have involved the whole English fleet, which was high, high superior with Navy and also with the Air Force, with the Air Force on the ships. So he, it was decided finally to go through the channel. Sailing the German warships through the English Channel might have avoided a direct confrontation with the British home fleet, but it was still a treacherous path. The Germans would still have to contend with British coastal gun batteries, as well as attacks by the ever-alert RAF. The entire operation was a calculated gamble for Hitler. The overseas. When Hitler had finished, he took me aside and talked to me and said, do you believe this operation can be successfully performed? And I answered my Führer, this will depend completely from the surprise. The preparation must be taken 100% secret and secret, then it can happen. A lot will depend from the weather, but most will depend from the surprise. And Hitler said, OK, this is good. We will go ahead. Hitler entrusted Galland with command of the fighters for this bold naval operation. His fighter force would play a pivotal role escorting and shielding the German ships from RAF strikes. As well, the German ace was asked to select a name for the secret mission, a decision which irked the proud Kriegsmarine commanders. One thing which was something uh, ridiculous on, on the whole story. Uh, there should be invented an, a, an, a name for this operation, a camouflage name. And uh, 
I was asked and I said Donnerkeil, because Donnerkeil in German means uh, something like, what is it? Thunderbolt? No, uh, uh, not at all. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. But, but uh, as, as, as a wondering, if you know something but you don't believe, you say Donnerkeil. <laughs> Donnerkeil, what an operation. Huh? Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Oh, yeah. Well, Amazing. Think, yeah. Amazing. <coughs> it means uh, thunderbolt. thunderbolt. And the Navy decided not to have the same nickname because they didn't like it. <laughs> it was invented by a fighter pilot, a young fighter pilot, and they will never take what the young fighter pilot suggests. <laughs> so they said uh, Cerberus. And it did turn out that the difference in the two uh, camouflage names did work very well. They, the English side, the English Secret Service, did believe these were two different operations. And this was in favor of us. Oh, yes, so help with the surprise. It was, yes. was helpful. Engaged in a war on the Eastern Front, only about 250 German fighters were available to form a shield to protect the German fleet during its channel dash. To maintain continuous protection, fighter units of 16 would be sent over the fleet for 35 minute shifts. Training for the mission went on with the utmost secrecy. The German uh, fighter commanders didn't know what was going on. They didn't know about the escape of the, of the ships. They, they were informed we would make a limited op uh, offensive operation. So they knew it only on the same morning when the ships during the night had been gone out. On February the 11th, 1942, Operation Thunderbolt commenced under the cloak of darkness. All through the night and into the morning, the German fleet and their fighter escort slipped along the channel unnoticed. The German fighters had to fly as long as possible in low level in order not to be detected by the English radar. And our commander of, of the uh, communications, who had below his command the radar organization, he used at the first time a uh, system which did camouflage the fleet and which did give the English impression that a big incursion was coming on. And this system has worked very, very well. English radar was completely confused. It wasn't until 1100 hours the following day that the British forces spotted the German warships. More than two hours later, the first RAF planes, Fairy Swordfish torpedo bombers, arrived on the scene. These sluggish British biplanes were soon devoured by the German fighter force. The first which did attack us were this hopefully inferior biplanes. Small biplane, yes. Biplanes. They were very, very brave. They were shot down. 100%. The fighters did, did an extremely fine job today. Wave after wave of British fighters and bombers attacked the German fleet and its shield of fighters. But on this day, Germany would have her way. Operation Thunderbolt was almost a complete success. The fleet arrived with minimum casualties and damage. Did you, uh, did you meet with Hitler afterwards to discuss the no, success of no, it? No, no. no. But uh, I was made general very soon. That's uh, better than this. talking to him. Without it? mentioning, without bringing oh. this together with this operation. Because uh, this operation was only to a certain extent a success for the Germans. The, the passage was a success. But the fat, fact that to escape from Brest was negative. And, uh, so he didn't want to publicize yeah, the fact that they yeah, had to yeah, abandon yeah. the base, I see. I think we shot down about 60, 65 English planes the day. We had 18 losses. But in total, for me, it was a wonderful operation. Though a successful military operation, the tides of war would soon turn against Germany. The Channel Dash was meant to safeguard Operation Barbarossa, but the Soviet Union's harsh winter and fierce soldiers proved to be even greater foes than Hitler anticipated. 
In the winter of 1942, while Germany was embroiled in the Battle of Stalingrad, Gallant met with General Jeschenek, the Luftwaffe's chief of staff, to discuss Germany's grim fate. General Jeschenek, this was a man who could, even he was a follower of Hitler, but you could talk against Hitler with him. This was possible. The only of the few people who could, use, who could do this, who could do this. And when in 1942, we, the Germans, had in mind to make the decisive offensive against Moscow and other towns, Stalingrad and the Crimea. But the weather has not allowed to make a bigger offensive, has delayed this pre preparations terribly, and the Russians did start their offensive. And in this occasion, all fighters, fighter schools, fighter reserves, what we had, they were closed and everything was uh, directed against Russia. Against the East, yeah. Mm -hmm. Russians. And I talked to Yashonek in this occasion and I said, this is the end. How, how, what can we do next year? And he said, don't care, don't take care of this. When we lose this offensive in the spring, the war is lost. So we talked about losing the war, and one thing was terrible. There was the conditions in which the war could be ended. This was the unconditional surrender as only outcome of the war. To compound Germany's problems, Allied bombers soon devastated cities like Hamburg in massive night bombing raids. They were able to counter the obsolete German night fighter and searchlight system by sending in single streams of bombers and dropping countermeasures to fool the enemy radar. General Kampuber was a man who was responsible for the night fighters. And he had his special system. He had the circle of one radar. He had one fighter, and this fighter was leaded against the target. But when Hamburg occurred, and, and your bomber command did make first this air stream of bombers, together with the strips with the, the window or chaps. Window, yes, window uh -huh. His system was completely out. And the night fighters, also at this time, they wanted to follow the bomber stream in the night because they could see them. They, some, many times they could see them and they saw the signals they were dropping. They saw the burning bombers. In, in the stream. So they could easily follow and over the target. Everything was light. Light because of the fire. Lighting, all light, of, yeah. of course, the fire. Of course, the uh, fouls. Searchlights. Yes. Searchlights. Yes. And uh, they couldn't understand. They were forced to stay in a circle. Frustrated by General Kamhuber's ineffectual system, the night fighter force turned to Gallant to intervene. They came to me. And I had to tell this girl. And after Hamburg, when hit this system with the circles, did completely fail. He made me responsible for the night fighters too. I didn't understand very much. I have only some night missions done uh, in the second seat of, of a night fighter. But I personally have not shut down one uh, aircraft in, during the night time. It's a whole different situation. Uh, now. Completely yeah. different, completely different. But I had, as my inspector of the night fighters, I had an expert who knew this and who explained this to me. So I think the night fighters themselves, they were more or less happy uh, to be on a mine command. Not so with Kamuba. Kamuba did believe I had 
originated his replacement. He must have known that it had failed, though, and his, uh, because it, it didn't stop the attacks, and, and when you took over, things got no, a, lot, no. a lot better. No, but that was the only answer the only. Uh, to the new British night tactics. Uh, yes, night tactics. Yes. Mm -hmm. While the British devastated Germany through the night, the Americans took part in their own precision daylight bombing raids, crushing Germany's infrastructure. Hermann Goering, looking for a scapegoat for his own chaotic management of the Luftwaffe, criticized Galland and his fighter force for failing to repel the American bombers. I was unfortunately present at a meeting when Goering in Schleisheim near Munich had a meeting for about 30, 35 uh, high-ranking German officers and he was upset about the last encounter with the American aid bomber fleet. And he was blaming the fighter for not performing, not performing the escort during the Battle of Britain, not performing now to stop the American air offensive. And he did blame us and he did call us scrubbergates and I don't know what to do. And he said, you, your people have got so high awards during the Battle of Britain for the victories you have not really made. You have only, you were lying on this. Oh. And when he said this, I took my declaration and hit it on the table in front of him. There was a silence. No, absolute silence there. Even Goering couldn't say any word. And he finished very soon this meeting, took me out and said, please don't do this, please don't do this. I was uh, nervous and this is not my opinion. I said, and we we'll never wear it until you extend a uh, declaration that this is not true and this is not your opinion. He didn't do so. so I took all my decorations off and uh, in my office, my office at this time was in, in the Olympic uh, game stadium. stadium. Stadium, oh I see. And there was an office and, and this, uh, this was my office for the war time. I had my trophy, part of my trophies there, this wooden cock, the big cock I had there and I put the last decoration I put around the neck of one wooden cock, <laughs> a blue, dark blue uh, neck, and I put two lights on it. <laughs> and everybody who came wanted to see the wooden cock with the diamonds, <laughs> and I showed him this to this. They fit, they did fit him wonderfully, wonderfully. <laughs> so then uh, one day Hitler had seen a photo of mine in a German newspaper in on the cover front, very big picture mm -hmm. without decoration. And he asked, what is going on? Ah, no, before he did this, my quarters was bombed, the Olympic game field it was bombed and the decoration and everything, a complete office did burn off, up. So, uh, and Hitler uh, said, uh, did ask his surroundings, what is the reason why Galland is not wearing his, the highest decoration? And they told him, that has been burned in, in the in Olympic the sporting <laughs> game. Yeah, yeah. By an American, by an English uh, air attack, night attack. And he said he should come see me, I have a new set for him. <laughs> And uh, I went up without decoration, <laughs> and he gave me number four. <laughs> In addition to the military losses suffered by the Luftwaffe fighter force, Gallen suffered personal tragedies, the deaths of two of his brothers, fellow pilots Wilhelm Ferdinand Galland and Paul Galland. Uh, this picture down below here, these are your two brothers. Uh, yeah. And they were both lost in the war, is that correct? Yes. The little one was killed first, 
you know, there was a little attack on Canterbury, and he was uh, escorting fighter bombers, one of nine fighter bombers. And on the way back, they were attacked by Spitfires. And uh, he climbed into the clouds, and since he couldn't fly by instruments, he came out immediately from the clouds, and they were in the middle of the, the Spitfires. Mm was shot down and it's laying here in this channel. How many victories did he have before? He had he was 17. 17. And, and he was only 23 years when he died. And your other brother? My other brother was two years elder, three years elder. And he had a very good talent as a fighter pilot. He had difficulties in the beginning, but he was perfect fighter and a very good uh, group commander. And he had uh, 57 victories in between these seven foreign engine bombers, B 17s. And uh, he was very talented, very good. Uh, it must have been, that was, that was an impressive group, group, number of victories that time, at that time. Very good war, group commander, he had uh, the Knights Cross also. Mm. With each passing day, the outlook became more hopeless for Germany as they battled the Soviets and faced the punishment of the American and British bombing campaign. But did Galland, a living legend of the air and general of the fighters, believe his pilots could somehow change the outcome of the war? You may ask me, did you believe you could change the war? Not at all. The war was completely lost. The war, the war was lost when we started the offensive against Russia. Yes. Perhaps the war was lost when Hitler started it. Because the Americans, the Russians, and the Catholic Church as enemy, and you are lost, you can, <laughs> can be sure. And the British. And the British. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, what kept you fighting? Uh, after you really knew that the war could not be won? We were fighting for anything better than unconditional surrender. And we thought there must be a chance, perhaps, that England and the Americans are going against Russia or something like this. Galland and his pilots also continued to fight to defend Germany's helpless civilian population as best they could from the relentless bombing raids. The general of the fighters believed the ME-262, a jet fighter with a maximum speed of over 500 miles an hour, was the ideal interceptor to counter these attacks. We had now the first and the best jet fighter in our hands. The terrible attacks of the American Air Force, of the 8th Air Force, the 15th Air Force, and the English Air Force during the night, the Bomber Command, they were going on. The German population, the losses were so high that uh, we, we couldn't say we, we, we don't fight anymore. Even if we knew the war is lost. And the chances that uh, we can change anything, they are about zero. Mm. Uh, only for the feeling when the population is suffering in such a terrible way and we have a good weapon, we have to continue to fight, and yes. we did it. To protect the population, Galland advocated building up a huge reserve of fighters and striking the Allied bombers in an operation known as the Grosch Schlag, or the Big Blow. By downing as many bombers as possible in a massive strike, he hoped to stall the American attacks, at least temporarily. But Hitler, focused on offense, squandered Gallen's reserves. It was the same preoccupation with offense which led Hitler to order the ME-262 to be modified into a fast bomber. I have fought for the 262 since I had flown it first in 1943. Uh, Hitler had a little bit later, already ordered, this plane should be used as a fast bomber, as a blitz bomber only. 
And he said, I will fight the forthcoming invasion with this plane. Nobody of you has seen this possibility. We knew that this plane would be a terrible bad fast bomber. It would have been an excellent fighter, especially against the American day bombing offensive with the four-engine bombers. Hitler's decision to convert the 262 into a blitz bomber ultimately slowed the development and production of one of Germany's most advanced and deadly weapons. However, this was not the only time Hitler meddled directly with the 262's design. He uh, has ordered a 5.5 centimeter cannon, tank cannon, to be installed in the Messerschmitt 1 262. It was sticking out about <laughs> yeah. looked like a, three like, feet sticking out from the front. Looked like a swordfish, yes. <laughs> yeah. And when you you could only shoot bum. <laughs> bum. Bum. And every time you make a made a shot, the plane was shaking <laughs> like this. Galland, focused on defending the civilian population continued to push for the ME-262 to be used as an interceptor. His single-minded advocacy of this cause and his open opposition to the orders of the Luftwaffe's high command landed him in hot water with Goering. He finally was so annoyed that he extended, Goering extended the order. The plane should never be mentioned as a fighter, as an interceptor, never. He gave an order not to use this expression anymore. So, and I continued fighting for this until I was replaced, I was fired as general of the fighter arm. This was in December 44, five months before the war ended. And uh, Göring had in mind to make me responsible for the defeat of the fighter arm. And uh, he was preparing a court. Court martial? Court martial. And Speer, uh, I could manage to get Speer involved, Speer informed about my situation. And Speer, in the same night when he got his me this message, went to Hitler in his quarter and informed Hitler. And Hitler said, this should be all actions against guns should be stopped immediately. For me, it is absolutely clear Goering wants to have a scapegoat. good. He is giving the fort to another man like he is doing this normally. So it, it was stopped. And then Hitler extended the order, I should set up a small formation and give the proof that this plane could be used as, as an interceptor very well. Gallant's reinstatement as a frontline commander may have been a way for his enemies in the Luftwaffe to hasten his death. As well, Perhaps as a symbol of Goering's irritation with Galland, the German ace was forbidden from attaching his name to the new jet unit. Goering ordered me this formation should not carry my name, should not be named Jachtverband Galland. And uh, he asked me, what, what do you propose as name for it? I said, uh, JV44. JV stands for Jachtverband 44 two fours because it was in the end of 44 and I saw I will never get more than four and four eight planes and also as a joke in Germany uh, a four is a fear a fear sounds very familiar with Führer I said let's now try with two fear with one fear it doesn't work anymore <laughs> this time is too 
Galland was able to hand-select the men of the JV-44, including pilots who had taken part in the mutiny of the fighters, men who had supported his reinstatement as general and were critical of the decisions of the Luftwaffe High Command. It was a star-studded group. His top five aces had more than 1,000 combined kills. I could take over as pilots, men like Steinhoff, like, like Hohagen, Kupinski, and, and others which were involved in this fighter mutiny, which had taken place in between. Uh, you, can, you can have all these men, Göring told me. You can have all these men. Uh, and then we have set up this formation in Brandenburg, Paris, near Berlin. Steiner was the man who was responsible for the operation and for the training. And we went down to Munich, to the former airport from Munich, München der Rhin, and we have operated the last six weeks from this airport. It's quite a success. We have shot down a total of 50 airplanes. Though the JV-44 enjoyed some success as a unit, they could not stop the inevitable defeat of Germany. However, if the ME-262 had not been delayed by indecision over its role as a fighter or bomber, might it have had an impact on the outcome of the war? What, what do you think would have been the uh, effect of having the, Mess the Messerschmitt 262 available as a fighter six or eight, ten months earlier? We could have had it. Uh, the development has been stopped by Hitler himself in one situation when he said all developments which are not ready for use in combat during the next eight months have to be stopped, have to be postponed. This has delayed the further development of the 262, especially of the engines. But they have continued against the order of Hitler, but only with uh, the limited mm -hmm. force, and we would uh, could have had the 262 available in numbers of about let's say 500 up to 1,000 a year before. It was my f firm, my firm opinion, and this with this force being used only as interceptors, we would have stopped the American day offensive. That's for true. Yes, I've heard that from the American side too, that uh, the devastating for, attacks I, and I, they I, couldn't stop them. I'm completely convinced we could not be stopped. And the losses would have been so heavy on the other side, on the American side, that they had to, to break, they had to finish this. Perhaps they had to go in bad weather or in during the, in the night, in, to the night. But uh, since we didn't have it, it didn't occur. And, and the result, if we would have stopped the day offensive, would have been negative. This would not have mean we would have won the war. It was too late. It would have extended it, probably, wouldn't this it? This would have extended the war. The Americans were already in Europe, the invasion had taken place. This would have extended the war and would have delayed the advantage of the Western Allies. And the Russians would have come in from the east more and more and would have occupied more European territories, which would have been even worse. Much worse yeah. in the long run. With Hitler weighing in on so many key decisions regarding the 262 and the Luftwaffe, one has to wonder how much he was personally responsible for the downfall of the German Air Force. Dolfo, uh, how much of a handicap or problem to the Luftwaffe was Hitler's lack of understanding of, of air power and the use of air power? This, this was of, of the highest importance because he did not understand what was going on. Hitler's thinking was only aggressive. He could only follow the bomber tactics. He didn't know what it means, air superiority. He never, never understood this. 
what he was saying is his own words was, attacks can only be counter-attacked by attacks. Bombs against bombs. Not fighters, not anti-aircraft against uh, bombers. It's sort of like an, an American saying that the best defense is a good offense. Yeah. Very much yeah. the same thought. But he did this all the time without any reserves. And unfortunately, he was even with, with his military decision, he was successful in the beginning. So it gave him a false sense of confidence. In, yeah, in not, the, not uh, all, but... Not uh, all, but... Not all. Yes. But uh, in the beginning, even Hitler himself, he did believe he could... His orders were all so coming with, the out, with a positive outcome. And uh, this has led to many, many mistakes later on, in combination with his offensive thinking. Normally, a, a normal tactician would build the Air Force only under the cover of air defense. But no, not so with Hitler. He built first the air offensive, the bombers, mm -hmm. and neglected the fighters. The chaotic management of Germany's Luftwaffe and armed forces would ultimately lead to her demise. Though the war was lost, Galland was still eager to make an impact on Germany's fate. He attempted to negotiate a deal with the Americans, which would have allowed the JV-44 to continue fighting against the Russians. His proposal, however, was quickly rejected, and out of options, Galland surrendered to the American army on VE Day. Unquestionably, Galland was a gifted fighter pilot and one of the great aces of World War II. However, his impact as General of the Fighters is debatable. Other than the Channel Dash, the only operation he commanded was an unsuccessful attempt to reverse the fates of the fighter force in Sicily. What we can be certain of was Gallant's devotion to his fighter force and to the German people. He was willing to stand up to the Luftwaffe's high command lock horns with Goering and oppose Hitler for the sake of these two causes. Perhaps these actions speak more to his bravery and valor than the victories which earned him a diamond-encrusted Knight's Cross.